Yovan Buha. Buha. Yo, yo, I'm Yovan Buha, Lakers beat writer for The Athletic, and welcome to episode eight of Buha's Block. I am pleased to be joined by friend of the pod and frequent guest in a past podcast life. Uh, <laughs> if for those who for those who listen to the Forum Club, uh, the Athletics uh, Lakers podcast, I had this guy on several times, plenty of times. I think you were my my most frequent guest. Uh, but without further ado, Mo DeKeel, writer for The Athletic, for Bleacher Report, podcaster for The Athletic, uh, in my opinion, the creator of Walk and Talk NBA content, uh, Mo. <laughs> how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Yovan. And uh, you know, if I, I, how come it took eight episodes for you to finally get me on? Is really my big question. So you're you're my fourth guest. You are following in the footsteps of Austin Reeves. Okay, Sam so he's, he's a he headliner. Okay. 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 Sam fine. Amick. Okay, I'll give and, Sam and Chris Herring. So like, I think you're, that's heavy hitters, good company. heavy hitters, yeah. heavy hitters. I'll, we're, we're I will let going. you pass. We're keeping it going. I'll let you pass. You. <laughs> but I want to give, uh, before we start, I want to give a shout out to my uncle Faisal, who's a huge fan of yours in a phone conversation with him yesterday. And, and, uh, I know he's, he's probably watching today. Uh, you know, so I just want to give him a shout out, a uh, diehard Laker fan. And, and, and he loves you. I appreciate that. Uh, so Faisal is his name. Yes. Shout out to Faisal. Thank you for <laughs> for watching and uh, apparently having an influence on on Mo to uh, to do this podcast. So yeah, I was yeah. gonna bail. I was just gonna be like, ah, but my uncle said, no, you got to do it. I said, okay. I, I appreciate it, uh, but I, I wanted to have you on because you're frequently at Laker games. You've had your pulse on this team uh, for for most of the season, and they're in a, a interesting point right now where. They have won 17 of 24 games since February 1st. They're on a five-game win streak, their longest win streak of the season. Yet, over this span of eight weeks, they've flip-flopped from ninth in the West to 10th in the West and back. And they've made up no ground. I mean, they made up ground technically within, like, games back, but, like, they have not ascended in the standings and climbed to the 7-8 game or out of the play-in entirely. Um, but looking at the, the last five games, uh, they beat the Hawks, the Sixers, the Pacers, the Bucks, and the Grizzlies. Uh, over that 17 and 7 stretch, they have the third best record in the league, uh, second in offense, 22nd in defense, tied for 10th in net rating. So, Mo, just an open ended question like, what do you make of the Lakers over the last eight weeks or so? How real is this? And as we start ramping up toward the play-in and the playoffs, uh, what do you think of this group and the momentum that they currently have? Yeah, so it's been like a really interesting run for them. And it's funny, like a few weeks ago when they lost to Golden State, you know, that on that Saturday night game, I thought it was like, oh, wow, they this might be over for them. And then they've, you know, been able to kind of go off this nice little five-game stretch. That win against Milwaukee in double overtime is huge without LeBron. And, and, and the way they played, but just, I think this is a very interesting squad in the sense of the start of the year, they were very defensive minded. It was a question if their offense could really lift them up. And then in this eight week stretch, their defense has faltered to be honest with you, but their offense has really kept them in games. And that's kind of been, what's been the more amazing part of it. Now, if they could find a way to have this offensive skill, would and, and just increase their defense just a little bit. I think you'd see a little more of an opportunity for them and find things a little bit different in their scenarios and how things work. But uh, I think that's kind of the interesting thing is that their defense is dipped. And I'd say also in this five game stretch, the defense has actually kind of improved a little bit as well. But it's uh, a question of can this really sustain for me at the end of the day, though, Yovan, I just look at them as a playing team and it wouldn't shock me if they don't get out of the playing tournament. I've been saying this for, for weeks now where you could tell me that this team has another Cinderella run to the Western Conference Finals, and I would believe that if the bracket broke in a certain way. I think it would have to be OKC Minnesota on their side of the bracket, and Towns doesn't come back, and, and they get those two in some order, and, and they win those two matchups, and then probably lose to Denver in the Western Conference Finals if, if Denver, you know, assuming Denver gets there. Uh, but you could also tell me they lose in the 9-10 game 
or lose, you know, maybe they climb up to number eight and then they lose the seven, eight game, drop the nine, 10 game to Phoenix or Golden State and they're out. And I, I would believe that too. Uh, so, I mean, this stretch, like th their offense has been incredible, really dating back to the turn of the calendar. Uh, going back to, to early January, they've been uh, a top three offense. And and now we have enough of a sample size where like, I mean, the, the firepower is clear, especially with this new starting lineup, which is what I wanted to transition to uh, where. So on, on February 3rd, uh, the plan had originally been to go back to Jared Vanderbilt and go back to last year's starting lineup after the trade deadline. But Vanderbilt gets injured in the game before in Boston. So the Lakers go to Rui Hachimura and he replaces Torian Prince. And since then, they're 16 and 7 and have continued to be one of the best offenses in the league. Defense, as you mentioned, ha has not been great, but with that group has been about around league average. Uh, but but overall, with Rui in the starting lineup, they are 20 and 10 this season. So that includes that stretch and, and some random games earlier throughout the season he had started. Without Rui in the starting lineup, they are 21 or without Rui in the starting lineup and, and with him out, he missed he's missed 14 games. They're 21 and 22. So uh, I, I know it's a small sample size, but that's all we have to go on for a right. season. You know, a, se a season within itself is a small sample size. And based on the sample size, the Lakers are much better with Rui Hachimura in the starting lineup. That is a 55 one pace over the course of an 82 game season. So looking back at this, and, and this was something that was real in the moment. This isn't just a, a hindsight thing. This was something I've been critical of with, with uh, the, the coaching staff and, and their decision making with the rotations and the lineups. Uh, but it is now bore out where when they finally switch to Rui Hachimura as the starter, you've seen this team take off. And again, looking at all the lineup data, Lakers have been better when they played bigger. They've been better with Rui and Vando at the three in comparison with Torian Prince and, and Cam Reddish. Uh, so with all that context, looking at how well they've played since Rui has entered the starting lineup and not just entered the starting lineup, but been playing consistently 30 plus minutes a night, closing games uh, more often than not. How big of a mistake is this? And had he started from day one, because that was uh, Vando got injured in training camp, but Rui was still available. Uh, had he started from day one, are we looking at a team that's maybe in the top six in the West? And we're talking about how they match up with the Clippers or the Pelicans or the Timberwolves and not talking about whether they're going to make the playoffs. How, how big of a difference would that have made in your opinion? There's a lot there. Are just one, I don't think it would have made a big difference because he's starting now. He's been starting since February. It hasn't changed my mind, right? <laughs> like it hasn't really moved me in a way of, oh, wow. Okay. This team has a serious chance to make it to the conference finals. Like this is a team. Even if they're in the playing tournament, we got to take them serious and they can make a run like they made last year. It hasn't moved me that way in that sense. And I okay. think, you, you know, we can we can talk about all that stuff. They still drop games to Sacramento. They still aren't able to find a way to beat the Nuggets. It's not like a – it's great and it's, and it's an important thing. And I think it's really a good run right now that he's on with him in the starting lineup and obviously – coming off the memphis game where he if, something about when he plays the grizzlies man he <laughs> just it's just it's just something about that there's there's something in it where just he gets a superpower and he can go completely it, off as we saw in the playoffs like you know and then in last night's game so i think there's a lot of stuff there that's that's kind of fun with it i have a hard time saying like that's a clear mistake you know, rotations are hard throughout the entire season and everybody's rotations changes and, you know, you're trying to figure out stuff like it's I'd say it'd be a mistake now knowing what we know. But in the through the course of the season, I think just saying right off the bat, yo, he has to be starting. I mean, it's like, ah, you want to see what it looks like with other guys. And we don't know what it would have looked like with Vando. Maybe they win games because their defense would be so much better. You know, and 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 I know there's a trade off a little bit offensively with Vando and and Ruri, and I like what Ruri does, and he's he, he he I love his movement off the ball and things like that. But I'm not a hundred percent sure. I just want to go like deep into like that was a huge mistake, and they'd be a top six team in that sense, just because there's a lot of problems with this team. It's not just you know Ruri Hachimura fixes everything. There's a lot of issues within this team in terms of. Some nights D'Angelo Russell goes completely off. Some nights he completely disappears. Reeves is is pretty solid, but sometimes you know th there, there's nothing from him. 
you, you, you've kind of sort of had to find your way. I mean, you know, some of the fun, the, the, the interesting stuff to look at is Christian Woods injury. How does that, you know, kind of like him not playing and not being available kind of helps them a little bit and gives them more time for guys like Rui and things like that to, to play it, it, it off the bench and that stuff. I think there's just, it's a great move now and it's easy to just look at the record now and say, okay, cool. That's a 55 win pace team. They'd be top six in the West. It'd be a different situation. I'm not sure it bores out that way. And I just think you got it now. And now you're, you're rolling with it. And now I wouldn't change anything because you're rolling pretty well. But I think, you know, in the moment or early on in the season and stuff like that, teams are constantly experimenting with their, their lineups and trying to figure out what's the right mix. So I'm going to respectfully disagree, but I think that's what makes for, for good podcasting just because I mean, no, I think, if you want to be wrong, that's fine. <laughs> I just, I, so for me, it's more of like in a vacuum, I think you can make the argument like you, you, Rui, I think Rui is like a, a borderline starter and with the way he's been playing recently, I, I think he looks like a clear starter, but that wasn't in, in the coaching staff's defense. This wasn't the way Rui played all season uh and and with Rui it's always been like he can get you a bucket and, and he does that whether he's playing 15 minutes a night or or 30 minutes a night it's been the other things and I, I thought that these last couple games were the first two games of the season he grabbed double digit rebounds and part of that was because uh, LeBron missed the game and then AD missed the game so he, he's playing a little bit more he's, he's playing closer to the basket and the Lakers were relying on him more uh, on the defensive glass but he's also been playing with a, a different level of focus and, and physicality and, and energy. And um, so I, I think I don't want to say it was as cut and dry necessarily uh, at the beginning of the season. That said, I entered the season. I mean, there's people I was talking to with the Lakers that thought Rui was going to start that expected him to start. Uh, once it became clear, Vando was the projected starter. Then Vando goes out. Uh, I think it's the second preseason game. So that throws th them for a loop. But then you go with Torian Prince, and and to me, there's just a there's a reason one guy's making seventeen million dollars a year, and one guy's making four and a half million dollars a year. I know salary isn't the the end all be all, but sometimes it is. And in this case, when you have a team that is a a very top heavy roster in terms of the salary structure, where you have the two max guys in LeBron and AD, then you have a next batch of mid level type guys in Austin, uh, D'Lo, Vando, Rui, and Gabe, if you were healthy, like that to me is, those are like the, the best supporting cast players. And those were the guys who should have been playing. And we had the sample size going back to last season of the Lakers starting Rui uh, at times and, and closing with him every game in the Denver series and, and him having pivotal stretch. I mean, you, you referenced the Memphis game, like he was big in that Memphis series. And all year, the lineup data uh, and again, it was less than a, a, a third of a season, but the lineup data with LeBron, AD, and, and Rui as a front line was incredible last season. And it was incredible again in the playoffs. And it's been incredible again this uh, th this season. And I, I think it's it's more of a, but, to no, me, it's more no, of like, I, go ahead. I, I want to push back though. Okay, so if he's starting all season, do you really think they're a top six team? Do you think when you look at this Laker team and, and, so, and, and the way they've played the last few days, they're better than Dallas? They're better than New Orleans, or they're better than the Clippers, and the Clippers have been playing god awful. I, but like, I'll just say, like, four, I, five, I think six. It, so I'm not, I'm not saying they're on the level necessarily of like the Clippers or the Pelicans, but I, I do think, I do think they win several more. I do think it's like a multi-game difference, and with how tight the standings are, like right now, the Lakers are two and a half games back of Dallas at six. They're two games back of Phoenix at seven, and they're a game and a half back of Sacramento at eight. So if you have two to four more your wins your numbers are wrong no uh is it or, or mine are let's find out i might have interrupted you poorly. i just wrote this last night so i, I you are I, correct i, I am i okay. did not refresh All right. <laughs> i have and this is for, for those listening we, we are recording this uh thursday evening so uh, i know some of these teams are playing tonight the, the numbers can, and i should change, have refreshed but... my standings before we started <laughs> folks i apologize it's sorry all, you it's all good so so as of thursday evening they're they're within striking distance of those three teams now we're going to get into Dallas and Sacramento uh, be, because those two teams have the tiebreakers over the Lakers. So like the, uh, unless one of those two, one or both like completely collapse here over the final eight, nine, 10 games, like Lakers aren't passing them, but it, let's just hypothetically give the Lakers, let's split the difference and say three more wins. You are the six seed. 
and and you're barely the sixth seed and you still have to close out the season strong but i do think like and, and to me it wasn't just because i know like i i've talked to, to uh, some people with the lakers and and they'll defend like you know the starting lineup is and everything blah, blah blah it wasn't just that though if you go back and look at like the the november and december box scores there were plenty of games where uh like the, there was a game so the third game of the season uh someone posted this uh the first game the lakers lost to sacramento torian prince played 41 minutes Rui Hachimura played 18. Like, even if we want to say Torian and his, his, his shooting, and like he's theoretically this 3 and D guy, and, and that fits better next to LeBron and AD, he should not be playing 23 more minutes than Rui Hachimura in any game, unless Rui Hachimura gets injured or is in foul trouble. Like, th there is a just a, a gap in, in terms of basic NBA talent there that in production that, like, I, I just, I, I think. And and look, like Torian did play better in the beginning of the season, but there did reach a point, I would say, in like mid December when the Lakers won on that stretch. So coming out of the in season tournament, they go three and ten. And that was really the stretch that that killed their season. Because if you mm -hmm. take that stretch out of thirteen games, they've been playing closer to that five, six, seven level of of a playoff team. But they have that stretch coming out of the in season tournament, three and ten. They lose to the Spurs, they lose to Dallas, they, they lose to all these teams. And Part of that stretch was Austin Reeves was already coming off the bench, but they benched D'Lo, uh, and at one point they have Austin, D'Lo, and Rui all coming off the bench to go with this weird wing lineup that, that didn't make sense because there was no shooting or ball handling in, in the group, and they're kind of galaxy-braining some of the rotation and lineup decisions, and the team just has the, their worst stretch of the season. And I look at that stretch when, like, that was when Torian kind of started to, to not play as well. If you look at some of his shooting numbers, I thought defensively, just carrying the physical load that he had to carry as, like, their primary wing stopper, uh, it, it just kind of drained his legs. And, like, since then, he has not really been the same player. Now, he's playing better recently, coming off the bench, playing a smaller role, like, 15 to 20 minutes a night. But, like, that was what he was originally signed to do, was to be the 15 to 20 minute a night guy. Rui was the guy you signed for $17 million a year. Like, you probably uh, to some people around the league I've talked to, like people think that's an overpay. P people were shocked by the Rui contract and they thought he got paid off of like two series in the playoffs. The Lakers invested heavily in him and to then have him be the 15 minute a night bench player for like stretches of the season just never really made sense to me. So like I'm more of the mindset that it's, it's not even necessarily like a starting thing. It's more of a there were times where like Cam Reddish and, and Torian Prince were playing more than Rui and Vando combined this season. And like that to me just makes absolutely no sense. There are times in the course of the season though, you got to see what you have in guys. And you're right. Like maybe he, maybe he stayed too long in, in starting and in, in not starting Rui. And you're right. Like he, he should have been playing more than 18 minutes in that sack game or whatever. Like there's no question about that stuff, but there's also, times where like this whole season ebbs and flows for guys guys go play really well guys play poorly whatnot there's a whole bunch of things that go with it and then as the coaching staff you got to find your rotations and sometimes it takes longer to find it may not be as quick as you would like Yovan. may not be as quick as the laker fans would like they may not come to the same conclusion as you like as quickly as you do because you're a smart guy with a great head of hair but like it's a whole level of, of uh, let's give you my new intro clip <laughs> Yeah, go for it, man. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I can help. But the 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 thing is, it takes sometimes a while for a coach to get there for whatever reason. You know, there was a reason Darvin said, I want to play Tory in Prince over, over Rui. And now he's gotten to the point now. And now it's like, I think us sitting back now and 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 nitpicking all these past decisions, we're 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 not really looking at the whole big picture now of what's ahead. And I think that's kind of the more important thing there. Like, it, I understand. Is it, is it more fair if I was nitpicking the decisions in the moment, though? And this isn't like a hindsight, like retroactive criticism? It, it, probably not, to be unfair to you. <laughs> But like the, because uh, it, it's hard to do in the in, in just in that. Moment. I'm just saying, like, I'm, I'm not. Nice. I'm not like going. I think like you know, because oh, Darwin, I, I know. Darwin was asked about this last night, and he and he kind of deflected and got defensive and like there was injuries and this and that and like my my pushback has been and i've referenced this before Rui became the starter because it wasn't even just like a starting like uh, you know st the starting lineup is, is obviously important but like it's not just that it's uh so th this starting group of lebron 80 Rui, austin delo they had a potential of 26 games that they could have played in 
before Rui became the starter. So just like a rotation lineup, a, a lineup you right. close with. They only played in six of those 26 games, a quarter of them. So it's like the 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 retroactive narrative that like Rui was injured and and this and that and that prevented this and that. It's like that's just not factually true. Even if you didn't believe in him as the starter, you could have gone to this lineup more than you did and you just chose not to for whatever reason. And then you busted it out 55 games into the season. And it's like, it just, it, it, that, that's where like, I think, yeah. So that, that's, I guess so this is like fresh in my mind coming off last night. No, which is fair. And like, okay, it took him 55 games to find the lineup. He found the lineup and they're playing well now off of it. Like it's, it's, I don't know what you want him to do. If he didn't find it in, I mean, should he be taking all of his cues from the reporters in the post game press conference when they tell him what to, I mean, I understand the data. Like when Wojcik said to pull the starters. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. <laughs> Wojcik's a whole different, that's a whole other dude. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> um, not, I'm not saying like, I guess it was just I'm, to be I'm, more like the, the data supported it. I know people within the organization supported it. And to me, the eye test, like the, the film and the eye test supported it. So it was just like, I would talk to, to scouts or people from other organizations or agents and whatever. And it would kind of be like, what are your thoughts on the Lakers? And a, a, one of the most common things I heard was like, I'm surprised Torian Prince is starting. I'm surprised Torian Prince is having this large of a role. And really like the, the only, like the only kind of connection there that like uh, you could kind of point to is like he did coach him previously. So maybe that familiarity gave him a certain level of trust or, or buy-in or whatever. It, it's just like after the first month and like, I'll say if, if you, if you want to like wash away the first month and a half of the season, I, I will accept that premise. I just think from like mid December on when this team really started struggling, it became clear what lineups were working, what weren't, and they've continued to work and not work throughout the whole season. And I just think the fact that it took like, another month and a half which which potentially cost this team a playoff spot that that's where i think the criticism comes from from me that's fair and like let's just let's just do the 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 darvin ham thing now every coach has these holes how many when you were covering the clippers how many things did we have with doc well, rivers never <laughs> staggering lineups never staggering his stars and things like that all of these yeah. guys have it it's 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 interesting like and you're i i honestly think him having coached torian prince in the past has influenced him in that sense. And maybe he's delusional and thinking of the guy in the past is he's going to show up. I just got to give him more minutes. I trust him. I just got to give him more minutes or whatnot. Like that's the kind of stuff that happens with coaches, you know? And it's like, here's the thing. It's so easy for us to do all this and say, oh, this is what should happen. And this is this, and this is that. We're not the ones that have to coach them every day. We're not the ones that are in the game meetings with them. We're not the ones that have to sit down with them or on the flights or on the buses and all of that stuff. Like it's so easy for us in terms of, and don't get me wrong. You're one. I nitpick lineups all the time too. It's what we do. It's part of our thing, you know, um, yeah. and, and all of that stuff. But it's, it's, this is the situation the th the, the positive thing is he's found the rotation. Did he find it later than, than if he found it earlier? Yes, it would have helped. And he had, there's no excuse for him not to have found it earlier data, all that stuff, whether the coach was open-minded enough or not, who knows, you know, that's, that's that stuff. That's the stuff that might've clouded his judgment. But like, I think the scenario, like he got there and he got there early enough to at least keep them in the playing tournament. And I mean, hell like Dallas stumbles, you know, a couple teams stumble and they, they keep rolling there and they're the six seed. Okay. And it works out perfectly because they're out of the Denver bracket. Uh, speaking of the rotation and and lineup decisions and another difficult decision that the Lakers coaching staff uh, has to make again now, uh, Gabe Vincent is joining the team in Indianapolis. That's where I currently am. Uh, Lakers play the Pacers on Friday night on the third game of their six game uh, East Coast swing. And Gabe is expected to make his I was going to say season debut, but play his sixth game of the season uh, in game 75 uh, on Sunday uh, against the Brooklyn Nets uh, per Shams Sharania of The Athletic. Uh, so with Gabe Vincent coming back, uh, I think you know, people forget, like this was the primary guy that the Lakers added this offseason. He was supposed to be the Dennis Schroeder replacement. And it was basically, we're running it back with, with the same guys and we're replacing Dennis with Gabe. We're adding in Torian as like a, an upgrade over like Troy Brown and Malik Beasley. 
and we're adding Christian Wood and Jackson Hayes as like upgrades over Wenyan Gabriel and, and Tristan Thompson. And on paper, this was a better roster entering the season when factoring in the continuity and, and some of the upgrades. But we have not seen Gabe Vincent, and, and he's only played you know kind of a scatter shot. Uh, if you look at his game logs, it's been a few games and then he's out, and then played one game. Uh, Yovan, he December. hasn't played. Let's just I mean, not, he just sure hasn't he's played, played five games. He basically hasn't yeah, played. But like, yeah, yeah. so what? What do you what do you make of the Gabe Vincent edition in game seventy five? And how do you go like? As someone who has been in these conversations and worked on the team side, and like, how do you go about implementing a guy this late into the season when every possession, every second, every minute counts for the Lakers and, and could be the difference between them? I mean, they're going to make the play in, but like, b- between being in the 9 10 versus the 7 8, or potentially, as you said, even getting up to number six in like a best case scenario. You know, is he over Cam Reddish and Max Christie? Do you take away some of the minutes from Spencer Dinwiddie, from Torian Prince? Like, do you play a little bit smaller? Like, how, how do you go about implementing him? And then how do you see him fitting in with this group? I started more of a Ruri Hachimura. <laughs> <laughs> nah, just kidding. <laughs> All right. And that'll do it for tonight's episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that was a good one. That, that, to, that was a good. You got to, me. Was, you got was, me. It was. Uh, I mean, I, look, I, it's. <laughs> I would not. I would say I would not be shocked. <laughs> I would actually not be shocked if that happened. That'd be amazing. Um, I would like. <laughs> it's okay. It's such a difficult. Okay, so what's plan to, B? It's just uh, yeah, plan B. You know, it's such a difficult situation for the coaching staff because the dude hasn't played at all. And like you know, he's ramping up, and you need to get him. You listen we know what he did for Miami in the the playoffs last year like he was a big part of them getting to the finals like it's it's so hard now to implement a guy bring in a guy hasn't played all season hasn't played with these guys all year so really doesn't have any chemistry and give him six games seven games is it seven games to 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 uh, get yeah well, yeah, they're, they're at they're Yeah, they're tomorrow's game or Friday's game 74. So, yeah, Bro- Brooklyn is game 75. So seven games to build chem- a year's worth of chemistry like that's Yeah, it's an impossible task right there. I said for sure you couldn't just put him and insert him straight into the starting lineup, which is maybe something they were planning to do had they got him back maybe in January. Right. And then gives you time to build it, whether you would have been a starter or not. Who knows? But sure, like, sure. Like you it's it, easier to justify it in January. Cause then you're saying we got to build the chemistry. We got to get to find our rotations there and mix these things up and figure out who's available. And now it's, it's hard cause they kind of got a good thing going five game win streak. You've talked about it. They're killing it since February. They're, um, you know, like they're third in offensive rating. Like the rhythm is going well. Everybody kind of knows their role and what to do. And now you're introducing a guy who's trying to find his role with this team. And this isn't, it's not going to be his fault and it's not going to be the Lakers fault, but it's like trying to figure it out. It's not, I mean, it's just as hard as trying to implement Spencer Dinwiddie and he hasn't been very good for the Lakers, you know, in the, in, since he kind of came to the team. And I think that's a, a, a challenge. Cause again, it just shows how hard it is to find the, the rhythm mid season, you know, and now basically at the end of the season, like it's almost an impossibility. You'll want, it won't shock me if he gets a couple, like just, 10 minutes here, 15, you know, minute games. And then, and then that's it. And then they go like, yo, we can't really, can't really ramp him up. We got our rotation. We know the way we want to play. So it's hard to kind of just bring him in. And it sucks because you're right. He was the prize free agent guy, you know, like that was the move, right? When you got Gabe Vincent, we were all like, oh, you know, like this is big. Um, But now because of the injuries, they're just in an impossible situation. I honestly don't know how you implement him. And I kind of go back to my days with the Clippers when uh, we were with Vinny Del Negro and Chauncey Billups was coming back. You know, Willie Green was shooting the hell out of the three ball. You know, and 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 Chauncey Billups was coming back from an Achilles injury. And then, you know, once he's ready to go, we had to bench Willie Green and try to ramp up Chauncey Billups towards the end of the season. And that just didn't work out for us. And we were all, you know, we all wanted Willie to be starting just because we knew the rhythm he was in. And I think that's the hard thing you got to figure out with all of this stuff. Like Darvin's in an impossible situation with, they would have been better off with Vincent not coming back. If you want my honest opinion. 
Well, and then uh, on top of that, uh, I continue to hear murmurs of Jared Vanderbilt coming back uh, maybe the, the first week of April or, or kind of leading into that that second week and him potentially getting a few games under his belt before the play in tournament. So then you're, you're adding in another guy that uh, but at was least about he, to be the starter. At least he has continuity, though. He was sure. with the team last year. The guys know how to play with him. I mean, we're basically talking about bringing in a brand new player in Gabe Vincent. Yeah. You know, and it's no, and it's, no I and mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. Yeah. With like when you bring it in Vanderbilt, you know, at least he knows that stuff. And, and the, the LeBron knows how he likes to cut and how to how he played, how to play with him. So does AD. So does Reeves. So, you know, I mean, there's a little bit more to that stuff. But like when it comes, I mean, this is the thing with the Vincent thing, like it's really going to be hard. And of course, you know, I say that and he'll drop like 40 on, on <laughs> Sunday and I'll be like, mm. well, it, it it helps that he's coming back to play the Nets, the Raptors and the Wizards. If right. there was ever a a palate cleanser for, for you to come back and, and just, you know, play against some pretty bad defenses. Uh, those three, uh, I think, are, are going to help matters. It's also ironic that he's coming back against Dennis Schroeder uh, in that, that Nets game. <laughs> and then you have the whole uh, Dennis Delo subplot, which I'm, I'm going to be fascinated by. Because I think Dennis, uh, he did not take Delo's comments in that ESPN story well. And I, I think I think there's going to be one of those like hold me back uh, altercations. I, that, that's my prediction I, I, for, for Sunday. Yeah, I could see that. But yeah, I'm I'm with you. Like I, I think to start, I would just uh, like Max Christie. Okay, like he's out of the rotation. Cam Reddish. The Lakers continue to try to make uh, you know reminds me of the you know make and fetch happen. It's trying to make Cam Reddish happen. Like it's just not happening. And defensively, he he's he's still good, but he's such an offensive liability where teams don't guard him. He he misses. It feels like he misses one to two open threes a night. And then he'll try and drive uh, off of, you know, a pump and go on the weak side and travel or miss the layup or then like try and drive and kick and like turn the ball over. So like, I think the Cam Reddish minutes probably have to be retired as well. Uh, so that gets you maybe like 12 to 14 minutes a night between Cam and Max that could just go to Gabe. And like, I think that's a start. And then you see how does he fit next to D'Lo? How does he fit next to Austin? I think I really think that the next three games on the road trip after this Indiana game, like against bad teams, bad defenses, you can kind of throw him in there and start to build some of that chemistry and really just kind of test like how, what does this look like? Um, I think you should still win those games regardless of if Gabe Vincent's playing like eight minutes versus fifteen minutes, but it is a challenge. And to like, and then again, I, I, the only reason I brought up Vanderbilt was because it's just like another variable of like right. I, I think Vanderbilt's gonna fit well, and I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up starting again at some point, uh, may, maybe in the playoffs, like de depending on the matchup. But I, I'm just saying, like, it's just another guy where like now you add in Vanderbilt, you add in Vincent, it's like okay, well now Cam and Max are gone, but now you got to take away minutes from Spencer, and you got to take away minutes from Torian, and maybe you take away minutes from Jackson Hayes and just downsize and, and play like a small ball five with Vando or Rui or LeBron at, at center. So like I, I'm, I think there's just for, for a coaching staff that in my opinion has not really handled the lineup and rotation decisions well in general to now be getting to healthy guys who should feature prominently in the rotation, like would have featured prominently in the rotation had this team been fully healthy. Like that, that's just an interesting kind of like monkey wrench with, with everything of like, now you got to figure out how do we add these two big pieces in and maybe you don't. And I think if, if one of them isn't going to be added in, it's it's good. Excuse me. It's going to be Gabe. Like he's the one where uh, I just think like at this point you, you added Spencer, Austin and D'Lo are play like Austin. I think people are, have, you know, just underappreciated how well Austin's been playing these last few weeks. Uh, but, you know, his assist to turnover ratio has been incredible. And like he, he's just passing and shooting the ball at, at a great level right now. But like D'Lo has been at a, a, I mean, since January, like he's been playing out of his mind, one of the best stretches of his career. So like, I just don't see where the minutes come from unless you commit to like three guard lineups. Uh, but I, I want to get into, oh, go ahead. Just, just real quick. It's a yeah. small three guard lineup though, it right? Is. Like it that's, is. that's the scarier part. Like that's the thing about it. Like that's probably the best way to and, go and Darvin, about it. Like that's a lineup he he likes, like going back to like, he, he played Dennis and D'Lo and, and Austin together sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a hard one though. In the West, the way the West is set up with, with the wings out there now, like that's the scary part. 
Yeah, so let, let's get into uh, a couple of matchup things here where I think I'm going to just combine these two. So the one team right now that the Lakers can jump realistically in the standings is the Phoenix Suns. And they're two games back of the Suns right now, both in the, the win column and the loss column. But the Lakers have the head-to-head tiebreaker. And luckily for the Lakers, they have the seventh easiest remaining schedule. Though that's not factoring in they have more road games than home games. It's purely just strength of schedule. Uh, in terms of opponent win percentage and the suns have the hardest remaining schedule in the league and if you look at it they're playing the clippers a couple times they're playing the timberwolves a couple times they're playing the pelicans they're playing the nuggets again they're playing the Cavs. like they have a brutal schedule uh so if the suns go like 500 and the lakers can close here something like six and three seven and two they have a, a real shot to tie phoenix in the standings and potentially jump them into the 7-8 game, uh, but awaiting them in the 7-8 game, if they do end up making it, is either likely the Sacramento Kings or the Dallas Mavericks. And on paper, I think you'd say, well, I'd rather play DeMontis Sabonis and De'Aaron Fox uh, when compared to Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving, but the Kings have had the Lakers number for two seasons now. They are 7-1 and one against the Lakers uh, over the last two years. They swept the season series. I'm obligated to say DeMontis Sabonis is 10-0 and 0 against Anthony Davis in their careers. <laughs> Even though four of those games came in OKC when he was like a, a backup you know, role player. But looking at the potential matchup against either Dallas or Sacramento, uh, if you're the Lakers, like who are you rooting for? To draw. I mean, of course, you're just rooting to, to get to number eight and, and to get into that game to give yourself two shots to make the playoffs. But like, let's just say it happens. Who would you rather face in that seven eight game, Dallas or Sacramento? Oh, I think it's Dallas. I think it's easily Dallas. I think the one thing when you look at with the way Sacramento plays, Sacramento plays fast, and I think that's a bit problematic. Like they got a lot of fast guards. That, that that causes problems for the Lakers backcourt. And then you touched on it, but like. It's, I mean, it's not, it's a little bit weird in just the numbers, but like the fact that Sabonis has been beating the crap out of AD, like that last game, it's, it's, it's hard. Like, I just don't think you want to one game to, to, to move on. I think you, you, you'd rather Dallas. I mean, Dallas still plays fa- a little faster with, with Luca and Kyrie, and they're on a good run playing off of each other. But I think, you know, I think AD is, a little freer in that matchup. And I think that makes the big difference for me in the, what they're doing and, and, and how you would defend. If I'm the Lakers, I think I'd rather have Dallas. And I know it sounds crazy because I mean, Luca's the MVP caliber type of player and can win a game on his own and, and same for Kyrie. But like, I just think the, the matchups, the way it kind of plays out and the situations I think you're better off playing Dallas and Sacramento. I think that's that's who you should hope to drop to the seventh seed. So I, I've I've gone back and forth on this because again, like I I, I look at like how, how much you factor in like team versus matchup. Because again, I think this, the scarier team in general is just Dallas, and yeah. I don't want to like to me like Luca obviously is an MVP candidate. He's probably going to finish top three in voting or t- top three or four, and he's just. I mean, he's in a lot of ways, like he's not the same player as LeBron, obviously, but like there, there are shades of like that late two uh, thousands Cleveland LeBron in terms of just his ability to dominate the game. And he does it in different ways, but like the passing and just the, the not being able to, to solve Luca in, in the pick and roll and, and just, he, he's just a tough matchup. And then you add in Kyrie and Kyrie has been playing very well the last couple of months. And I just look at it and I'm like, and then I, I like, the the uh, Daniel Gafford Derek Lively uh, combo at center and they have a bunch of shooters and one of the Lakers weaknesses is like they are shooting much better on threes over the last few months they, they're up to now seventh in the league o- overall this season but they are a low volume three point shooting team and, and despite the uptick in percentage they've been bottom three in terms of attempts basically this whole season so if you get into a shootout with the Lakers like yes that has I mean, against Memphis, they made 18 of 33, right? And right. if you shoot 55% on threes, <laughs> you you're probably going to win the game. But in a an actual, like Dallas has been able to get into shootouts with them and Dallas just has better shooters and, and maybe not better shooters, but more high volume shooters. And if Dallas is taking 45 threes and the Lakers are taking 31, uh, unless the Lakers dominate the free throw battle, which we, we do see that they tend to do, 
like but maybe the whistle is a little tighter in uh in a play-in game and you you get 22 free throws instead of 35 and that 13 free throw difference uh you combined with dallas just taking and making more threes than you like that could end up being the difference in that game so i actually lean a little bit towards dallas um because look at so I, i looked at the same stretch that since the lakers the 17 and 7 since february 1st dallas is third in offense 10th in defense and fourth in that rating so this last couple months like dallas has been playing uh, i think they have the third best record uh or tied for third best record in the west right now uh, over that sp- span which is just you know obviously uh like they've been playing like a, a team with home court advantage and sacramento's 12th in offense 16th in defense and 16th in that rating and like that's kind of more how I view them. I more view them as a closer to like a league average team. Now, granted, against the Lakers, they look like the the Nuggets Junior, right? And <laughs> like that's where. And, and I know, like in, in talking to, to people within the locker room, like the Laker, like there's a little bit of that sort of um, mental edge that that Sacramento has over them at this point, because like the Lakers just had two must win games against the Kings, and they lost both of them. And like they entered both of those games saying, "We want to win this. This is a must win." And they lost both of them and that that is demoralizing on some level so like i guess i would actually i, I would lean dallas just because i, I think th- they've like similar to the, the nuggets like the, the lakers have been in some of those games that they lost to the kings i think in a one game setting i think when it comes down to it i'd rather have to game plan to figure out how to stop demonta sabonis and De'Aaron fox than luca and Kyrie. and i could like i, I just i also look at like luca as a playoff performer and like he's taken it to a different level every postseason and he goes from being like a top five guy to like arguably the best guy in the league and he shredded the clippers defense when they had a younger Kawhi, a younger pg they they had a switch like really good switching scheme to throw all these wings on him and he absolutely sliced and diced them and unless jared vanderbilt comes back and can play like 35 minutes i don't see the lakers having any chance at slowing luca down if it puts up 40 and 15, you, I think you lose that game. So I, I don't know. It's it's not great either way. Like, I, I think I would favor both teams over the Lakers in the 7-8 matchup, I, to, to, to be honest. I, I would just say, though, like when it comes to Dallas and when you look at the matchup, they don't have anybody that can guard AD. Like, that's sure. just the real deal. Like, they just don't. And and Sabonis has proven to be very physical, and the the pounding that AD takes on the defensive end, defending Sabonis, kind of takes a lot out of him on the offensive end. So I think just kind of looking at that sort of situation, I kind of think like, man, I would, I, I, that's why I lean that way. It's, I, it's honestly that matchup. If I felt more comfortable about AD versus Sabonis, I'd probably say sack. But in this instance too, I just don't think Dallas can guard AD. I don't even know if they can guard LeBron. To be honest with you. And I think that's I mean, really be a- ne- neither team should be able to, but like Sacramento, right. I mean, even with her, like with Barnes and Lyles and, and Murray, like they've kind of been able to bother LeBron a bit and it, it hasn't made sense in, in theory and on paper, but that's why we, we, you know, we, the, the games are played and they're not uh, simulated before I get you out of here. I wanted to touch on one last topic. You alluded to it a bit earlier, but there has become this uh, theoretical argument about, should the Lakers want to face the Denver Nuggets earlier or later in the playoffs? And I think the answer is they, they'd rather just not face them, period. <laughs> and if there's a way to go through the West playoffs and just not play Denver, like that would be the Lakers' preference. Uh, but so Nick Wright brought this up and, and he made this point. Um, I, I think I forgot if it was on a show or if it was just uh, one of his, his uh, social media videos. Uh, but essentially the logic was, if you catch the Nuggets earlier in the playoffs, uh, you are fresher as a team, which has been an issue for the Lakers, obviously, with, with the health of LeBron and AD and going back to last season, they were pretty banged up and tired by the conference finals. And then on top of that, because of the structure of the first round, there are several points within a series where you have a couple days off. Uh, I think even one point in, in the Lakers Grizzlies series, they had like three days off in between games. So that would uh, theoretically be an advantage for LeBron and AD in terms of them being able to rest and recover and being a little bit fresher for some of those matchups to play really heavy minutes uh, against Denver. Uh, now, I think the counterpoint obviously is uh, I think, I mean, I don't think the Lakers could beat the Nuggets either way. And I, I think. In theory, if you play them later in the second round or the third round, there's a chance they suffer an injury 
to one of their their starters or just the the general war of attrition that happens in the playoffs maybe they get phoenix in round one and it's like a six or seven game series and then they get another tough you know they play the pelicans or the clippers and that's another six or seven game series and then by the time they're playing you in the conference finals they're a little bit worn down you're fresher potentially I mean, who knows? And then right. that's like the, the argument for that. So like, where are you at with the playing Denver earlier versus later? And it doesn't even matter because the late, like do the Lakers even have a shot with fresh legs or not uh, against this Denver team that has dominated them now going on two years? Well, let's start with, if you're playing them early, that means you went through the playing tournament. So you're not fresher. They're fresher. They've had an entire week off. You might maybe you maybe they're the second seed and so you and you're playing them so you made this you won the seven eight games so you only played one playing game if they're the one seed you played two playing games and now you're playing them like two nights later three nights later I I don't buy the yeah it's great in the first round they Lakers three days rest in between games do you know who also gets to rest during those three days the Nuggets. <laughs> Like it goes both ways, you know, in the terms of the freshness. So I don't really buy it's better to catch them early and and all that stuff. You want to extend it. And I think the scenario you talked about, you want to hope that they're in playoff war after playoff war before you see them. You want them to come to you, you know, after two seven game series, exhausted and and ready to now have to battle you guys. And hopefully you've you're fresher because you've won your series quickly and, and all that stuff. Ultimately, Jovan, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like the nuggets are too good. Like it's, it's, I just don't see a way for the Lakers to beat them. They might be able to take a game or two off of them, but I don't see a way for them to actually beat the nuggets in a seven game series. And by the way, I think that's pretty much every team in the league. If that nugget team's healthy, I have them winning the championship. No, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. And like, I think th- so the, the, the fresher argument, I think the only part of it I agree with is like, they are technically fresher, not than the nuggets, but like just they're fresher than they would be in the conference finals because part of what hurt the Lakers last year, I mean, one, like LeBron was never the same after he came back from his foot injury. Like he still put up numbers and he had that great game four against the nuggets where he, he had the, the 40 point triple double, but like LeBron if you go back and look, and I, I did go back and look over the summer at some of the film from earlier in the season, like LeBron physically, uh, athletically explosive, like from, from an explosion and speed and burst perspective was at a, an entirely different level before the foot injury than after the foot injury. And I think that just uh, continued to get worse and kind of compound throughout the playoffs. And by the conference finals, he was a bit of a shell of himself in terms of just his ability to get downhill and and because like theoretically in that matchup that should be one of the lakers strengths is like like i know aaron gordon is strong and and he's an elite defender and he's one of the few guys that like physically can hang with lebron from a, a strength and athleticism perspective but like lebron in previous matchups against denver was able to get downhill expose Jokic as a rim protector and score on him and i know denver has done smart things defensively to protect Jokic, and he's gotten better and he's an underrated rim protector. Um, but I, I still think like that's one of the Lakers' advantages in the matchup is like getting downhill and, and getting LeBron downhill in particular. And the fact that he wasn't able to do that consistently in that series, part of it goes to Denver's defense and, and crediting them. But part of it to me was just like LeBron didn't have the legs anymore. And I think the the, the larger thing there is like the Lakers were on this mad dash last year just to make the playoffs, going from 13th in the West to end up at seventh they had to expend you know several games where their key guys were playing 40 plus minutes and and uh pl- treating it like playoff games and now they're kind of doing the same thing and and th- so that's where like that's the only uh, i don't want to say it's it's the reason to favor playing them early because i would i would rather just you know wait, wait. let I think the one thing is out. <laughs> yeah the one thing is like you get a fresher lebron and ad and like i actually think that matters for those guys because i think they've had to carry such a heavy load this year that like like there's a I think it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility either where like the Lakers let's just say like absolute best case 99th percentile outcome like they beat the Nuggets they 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 have an incredible shooting series Denver's banged up maybe they have an injury or something like Lakers win but then that war of attrition starts to affect them later in the playoffs and like 
maybe they lose in the conference finals or maybe they they lose in the finals to the Celtics or something like I could see it catching up to them at some point so that's the one thing where I look at like maybe getting them earlier you at least have a better shot from a, a physicality perspective uh but ultimately <laughs> I don't see like I think this is a four or five game series and uh I, I, Denver has a mental edge on them they 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 have all the like Murray and Jokic turn to Kobe and Shaq against the Lakers. Like it's just like they're unstoppable. They're two man games unstoppable. It feels like they hit every shot in, in the last five minutes of each game. And like I think there's just I don't see the, how Lakers take more than like a game off the Nuggets. I mean, yeah, that's how the Nuggets beat teams. You yeah. just you know at the end of games they're going to get the best shot, and that's a problem. And they they so, did it to the Celtics twice, and like that, that was the everybody. thing where it was like. I mean, they've done it to everybody, but like that's like a finals preview of like, oh, yeah. you know, this is the heavyweight bout that I think basketball fans want to see is like Denver, Boston. Those are the two best teams in the league. Like, how do they match up? What, what does this look like? And it's just Denver out executes them and they out execute everyone except somehow Phoenix, I guess, uh, who, who just well, has insane shot no, making. But had no Murray, but you know, I think it's yeah, a, no Murray, a but of... but they, they had him uh, what a few weeks ago when when they played in, in Denver as well, right? Unless yeah. I'm missing, yeah, no, no, they, that. Did, they, um, did, they did, they did, they did. So, I mean, it's, but that's like, that, that, that's, you know, an outlier maybe. Um, okay. So we're in agreement, like later is better just because that, that leaves up. I mean, maybe they get eliminated or maybe they're just banged up or, or tired or whatever. And like, right. I think that's more of a realistic path than, than beating them uh, in the first round, because to your point, like the, I think the, the other thing that needs to be mentioned is like the Lakers close the season with a two game road trip, Memphis, New Orleans, it looks like they're going to be nine at worst. So the, they would go back to LA. But then if you win that, you have to go back on the road to either you know Sacramento, Dallas, Phoenix, wh whoever it is. And then you go to Denver. So like you're playing four games on the road within a span of like a week. And that's basically a road trip. And to go into Denver coming off of that type of stretch, that's a lot to ask. And you probably come in, get blown out game one. And then now all of a sudden it's all on game two. And if you don't win that, the season, uh, the series is basically over. So like, that's where it also, I, I think it maybe going through a couple rounds first, which again, we're making a lot of leaps here. It, right. It, right. Like Lakers making the playoffs, Lakers going to the conference finals. Like I get it, but this, this is all theoretical, but yeah. So I think we're in agreement there. Yeah. I got nothing. All right. Else. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy. Um, well, Mo, uh, that will do it for today's episode. I appreciate you hopping on and shout out to your uncle. And where can the great people of that are listening and watching right now uh, find you on, on social media and listen to your opinions and why Torian Prince uh, should be the Lakers starting small forward? I mean, he's your hero. Let's just be honest here. Torian Prince is your hero. Um, the... <laughs> You can find me at The Athletic with articles and X's and Mo's, right for Bleacher Report a couple of times a month. Uh, Nerder, she wrote every Wednesday on The Athletic Podcast Network. Uh, I do Twitch streams um, somewhat infrequently, but I try to do a couple a week uh, breaking down end of games. And you guys can all yell at me there about how uh, Jovan is right and I'm wrong, even though you know it is what it is. I'll never concede. Um, just find me on Twitch under... M O D A K H I L underscore N B A. Um, and yeah, just follow me on Twitter, X, whatever we're calling it, threads. And I always post when I'm going live and, and streaming. In all seriousness, uh, I love Mo. He's one of the best people in the business covering this sport. Uh, he's one of the smartest people in the business covering the sport. And I'm really appreciative of him coming on. And I think he's going to end up being one of my most frequent guests uh, yet again, and we can have more of these discussions and, and healthy debates. So uh, Mo, thank you again. Uh, and thank you to everyone for watching on YouTube and listening on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, I will be back Friday night with a post-game reaction to the Lakers-Pacers game. Another big game for the Lakers. If they can get through that one, the, the rest of the road trip is relatively easy. Uh, so thanks again for watching and listening, and I will talk to you soon.